Good evening, guys. Today we're going to be reading a short article, a feature article about the, uh, the author Clark Ashton Smith. Clark Ashton Smith, Emperor of Dreams, an article by James Van Heise. Ever since the Lovecraft and Howard boom began in the late 60s, a lot of attention has been turned toward the writers who brought fame to the old pulp magazine Weird Tales. But while H.P. Lovecraft and Robert E. Howard are constantly kept in print with new printings and reworked editions enough to make you think you haven't seen them before, the stories by their contemporary Clark Ashton Smith have fallen out of print with only a small number brought back by two recent collections published by Pocket Books. Smith was one of the most prolific and popular writers in the Weird Tales canon, and his stories often plunged much deeper into fantasy than either Howard or Lovecraft were wont to do. His stories took place not only in ancient times on lost continents such as Atlantis, but on other worlds and even in our own distant future. The stories of Smith's Zo Zothic cycle take place on the continent of Zothic, which exist eons from now when the shape of the land masses of the world has, the shape of the land masses of the world has changed and sorcery has returned to the lives of Earth's inhabitants. This setting enabled him to tell many kinds of tales of fantasy and horror against a backdrop which would seem unfamiliar to the readers of Conan or King Cull. Clark Ashton Smith, born in 1893, deceased in 1961, was a largely self-educated man who had decided to cease his public schooling after grammar school and teach himself from there on. His efforts succeeded him in making him a very knowledgeable man whose grasp of the English language became probably the greatest of any fiction writer of his day. Regarding his use of a wide-ranging vocabulary, Smith stated, As to my employment of an ornate style, using many words of classic origin and exotic color, I can only say that it is designed to produce effects of language and rhythm which could not possibly be achieved by a vocabulary restricted to what is known as basic English. An atmosphere of remoteness, va vastness, mystery, and exoticism is more naturally evoked by a style with an admixture of Latinity, lending itself to more varied and sonorous rhythms, as well as to subtler shades, tints, and nuances of meaning all of which, of course, are wasted or worsened than worse than wasted on the average reader, even if presumably literate. Smith's writings, although florid and moody, never overshadowed the story itself. The writing style was there to underscore the weirdness and the unearthly strangeness of the tales he so carefully wrought. Of the effect achieved, Ray Birdberry wrote, Take one step across the threshold of his stories and you plunge into color, sound, taste, and texture, into language. Most, Smith lived most of his life in a small wooden shack on a mountainside in Auburn, California. The majority of his writing was done because he needed money to support his aged parents, whom he lived with. When his mother died, when they died, his mother in 1935 and his father in 1937, Smith's literary production was reduced to a trickle of stories over his remaining years, his prolific output having come to an end. Another reason that Smith stopped writing fiction is that he was more consumed with interest in sculpting, drawing, and writing than he was with poet, prose, prose poetry. He had a book of his poetry published in 1912, which had garnered much critical acclaim on the West Coast, and this is where his interest truly lay. He pursued these interests diligently and had, draw had a drawing published in Weird Tales, an exhibition of his sculpture as well as other volumes of poetry published beyond the Star Treader and other poems. Although Smith lived like a recluse for much of his life, he very much enjoyed having visitors. In 1940, when his friend E. Hoffman Price brought Ed Edmund Hamilton along with him to the cabin in Auburn, they were enjoying the unspoiled scenery when Hamilton spied a couple of odd stones on the ground. He picked them up and noted that one of them had a face on it. It turned out that a lot of stones around his feet had weird faces carved onto them. It seemed that Smith used the stones for carving, and when he was dissatisfied with one, he just tossed it out of his cabin window. Smith remained unmarried until 1954, and even then remained in his small cabin until about a year later when it was destroyed by arson. 
It was suspected that an unscrupulous land speculator who was trying to get Smith to sell, sell it had paid to have the fire set to it. Smith finally relented and sold the property where he'd lived so peacefully for so many years. Although all of Clark Ashton Smith's stories are the weird of the weird fiction variety, he didn't allow this to be a restriction and move in many directions within the form. There are even some which indulge in sardonic and ironic humor, oftentimes so subtle that the reader wasn't sure if he was being put on or not. One of these is the testament of Athama Mouse, Athamouse, Athamouse, which appeared in November 1932 in, in a November 1932 issue of Weird Tales. The tale is told in retrospect by the now-aged former chairman of Comorium. Athamus relates the sad tale of the fall of Comorium and how it was brought about by a weird, unhuman criminal named Nignathi, Nigathan Zaum, who wouldn't stay dead, no matter how many times he was captured, beheaded, or and buried. The following excerpt, excerpt explains the dilemma. Alas for the vanity of earthly hopes and labors, the morrow came with its, with its unspeakable, incredible tale of renewed outrage. Once more the weird, semi-human offender was abroad. Once more his an anthropo anthropophagic lust had taken toll from among the honorable citizens of Comorium. He had eaten no less than a person personage than one of the eight judges and not satisfied with picking the bones of this rather obese individual, had devoured by way of dessert the more outstanding facial features of one of the police who had tried to deter him from finishing his main course. All this, as before, was done amid the frantic protests of a great throng, and the final nibbling at the scant vestiges of the unfortunate constable's left ear, Nigathan Jaume, had seemed to experience a feeling of repletion, and had suffered himself to be led docilely away by the jailers. While most of Smith's writings tended to be very straight and serious, stories like these seemed to have been written as a change of pace, employing humor which was so subtle that it tended to build in effect rather build in effect rather than immediately drawing attention to itself in any sort of obvious way. Smith also used his fiction to make mordant social comments of the life and treatment of the artist. In the prophecy, in the monster of prophecy, an alien being from a planet circling Antares comes to Earth to find a human being, being to take back a human being to take back to his planet so that he can fulfill an ancient prophecy and become the monarch. He finds a fitting subject in the form of a struggling poet who is on the verge of suicide when discovered by the alien. The man is convinced to accept the creature's offer with the following observation: It is true. No doubt that you, you will be damned to a certain loneliness among us. You will always be looked upon as a monster, a portentous anomaly. But such, I believe, was your lot in the world where I found you, and where you were about to cast yourself into the, into the most unpleasant river. There, as you have learned, all poets are regarded as no less anomalous than the double-headed snakes and five-legged five -legged calves. Still, sto still stories such as, such, such as that were the exception rather than the rule, as most of Smith's fiction employed death as an underlying theme with either the threat of death imminent throughout the story or else descending inex inexorably on the protagonist in the climax. One of the best examples of this type of tale is The Weaver in the Vault. It begins much like a Howard sword and sorcery adventure as three soldiers are sent to the ruins of an ancient city to retrieve the mummy of a king which their master requires for a necromantic ritual. The characters are well drawn and a convincing amity is created among them, but it's all a blind because a sudden earthquake brings the roof of the crumbling vaults down upon them, killing two immediately and trapping the third beyond all hope of escape. The survivor, Grotara, then sees a bizarre glowing glo globe-shaped creature issue from a fissure and drift over one of the bodies, hurling out a strange web as it descends upon the corpse. The sequence is rendered quite vividly by Smith, and as in the following as the following demonstrates in this excerpt. Now the web had filled the entire tomb. It ran and glistened with a hundred changing hues. It dripped with glories drawn from the spectrum of dissolution. It bloomed with ghostly blossoms and foliages 
that grew and faded as if by necromancy. The eyes of Grotaro were blinded. More and more he was meshed into the weird web. Unearthly, chill as the fingers of death, its gossamers clung and quivered upon his face and hands. He could not tell the duration of the weaving in terms of his enthrallment. In the term of his enthrallment, dimly at last he beheld the thinning of the luminous threads, the retraction of the trembling arabesques, the globe, a thing of evil, beauty, and aware in some hollow cryptic fashion, had risen now from the empty armor of Yanur, diminishing its former size and putting off its colors of blood and opal, it hung for a little above the ch chasm. Grotara felt that it was watching him, was watching Thurlain Lodu Lodach. Then, like a satellite of the nether caverns, it fell slowly into the fissure, and the light faded from the tomb and left Grotara, Grotara in deepening darkness. The remainder of the weaver in the vault portrays another characteristic common to Smith's writing, that, that being a careful rendering of the psychological state of the character, in his confrontation with the horrific and terrifying, we are not only given careful descriptions of the weaver's return visit to the shattered vaults, but also Grotara's crumbling mental state in the face of it all. Thus Smith describes the horror from both the visual and the mental. This story in particular is considered one of Smith's best. The Nameless Offspring is one of the few stories where Smith departed from creating weird and fantastic worlds, and instead told a tale taking place entirely in the world of today. These were actually more difficult for Smith to write, as he couldn't resort to the invented exotic backdrops, and was hard-pressed to bring about his same surreal visions into the modern-day setting. The best he can do in The Nameless Offspring is to set the story in an old, out-of-way mansion, begin the story at night, and make the daytime scenes rainy and dreary to add to the oppressing mood. Smith had an easier time with the contemporary setting in Genus Lo 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 Loci, a story about an eerie tree-shrouded pond which had an unsettling and deadly influence on those who refused to shun its proximity. By the time the story finishes unfolding, the setting has been painted so clearly that you're sure it exists. He also dabbled in the realm of straight science fiction, like the master of the asteroid, to those which were tinged with fantastic visions like the city of the singing flame wherein a man steps through a dimensional gate and is transported to another world where he encounters wonder after wonder and almost transcends to a plane beyond time and space. The latter story was read by a young Harlan Ellison in the late 40s and was a pivotal influence in his choosing science fiction as the realm where he would begin his long career. Another type of science fiction Smith wrote was much closer in theme and style to his weird fiction, and is exemplified in the vaults of Yo Vombis. In this story, a group of archaeologists exploring Mars uncover an ancient horror in the pits below a ruined city. For those who like their weird fiction in a How Howardian vein, the Black Abbot of Puthuum is the perfect bill of fare. This story has, an, has all the elements of the best Robert E. Howard sword and sorcery stories, but with that extra touch only Clark Ashton Smith could give it. Over the years, Arkham House Publishers issued six collections of Smith's works, beginning with Out of Space and Time in 1942 and ending with Other Dimensions in 1970, all of which are now out of print. Ballantine Books issued four collections over ten years ago, beginning with Zothique in 1970, all of these were carefully edited for completeness by Lynn Carter as part of the Ballantine Adult Fantasy imprint. What Lynn Carter did in the series was attempt to restore the stories to their original form since the original pulp editors tend to blue pencil the stories for fear of their readers wouldn't be able to understand them. With the aid of Smith's widow, Carter was able to secure carbons of some of the stories and restore them to their original form just as Smith wrote them because in most cases Smith's stories were reprinted just as they appeared in Weird Tales. If you think this sort of editing was an unusual practice long since abandoned, you're mistaken. The Conan books, edited by L. Sprague de Comp, have editorial incisions made by him for reasons of taste. 
which is why Carl Edward Wagner edited the versions published by Ber Berkeley Medallion to restore the lost text. Even Ballant Ballantine's Tarzan series was subtle, had, has subtle deletions of things regarded as possibly racially offensive, which appeared intact in the old pulp and hardcover versions of the stories. Even with the editorial deletions, the readers of Weird Tales in other pulp magazines must have often been mystified by this extremely unusual writer who rose to prominence in the 1930s, as his work and his writing remain unique and fascinating to this day.